I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Producer's Perspective podcast. Greetings from the Hamptons. That's right. I've taken this podcast on the road. I am at the Bay Street Theater in Sag Harbor, where I just moderated a panel on new musical development featuring my wonderful guest. So I kidnapped him and strapped him to my hotel room chair and forced him to do this podcast. Uh, and that guest is none other than playwright, screenwriter, performer, Charles Bush. Welcome, Charles. Well, hello. It's wonderful being kidnapped. <laughs> Charles has been entertaining audiences with his very unique plays and performances on and off Broadway for several decades now, including Vampire Lesbians of Sodom, which remains one of the longest plays in off Broadway history. Longest running plays. Longest running. It wasn't <laughs> long. It was run. only an hour and a half. <laughs> you can see what we're in for. We're in for some fun on this podcast. That's right. The longest running plays in off Broadway history. Psycho Beach Party, Die Mommy Die, The Divine Sister, and of course the Broadway smash hit and Tony nominated The Tale of the Allergist Wife. He has adapted and starred in some of his own work on the big screen, has lectured and conducted master classes at many colleges and universities across the country, including NYU and Harvard, and received many awards over the years, including a special Drama Desk Award for career achievement as both performer and playwright. Not too many people can claim that, and was given a star on the playwright's Walk of Fame outside the Lucille Lortel Theater. Uh, you can read all about him at his website, charlesbush.com. So, Charles, let's uh, start with a very simple, mm -hmm. where, how did you fall in love with the theater? Where did it start? You know, I can't remember when I, when I didn't love the theater, but I was so fortunate that I actually grew up in New York City. I'm one of those rare people who actually are from New York City. And uh, and I had a like like many people, I had an extraordinary aunt. You know, it's fine. it seems to be a recurring thing with, with people. And extraordinary aunt, and she uh, started taking me to the theater when I was about eight years old. But I, you know, I joked that we, you know, she would belong to these sort of like the Macy's Theater Club, where you would, you know, you would uh, order your tickets at the beginning of the season or the season before. You know, so you didn't know what was gonna, what anything was going to be like, and you had to just pick. On faith, so we t tended not to see any of the hit shows. We would just pick the flop shows. So, I, so as a kid, I you know I saw Baker Street, and Tavarich, and the girl who came to supper. And Here's where I belong. You know all these these you know, kind of shows that weren't successful, but uh, it was you know just magical thing. Yeah. So I just always wanted to to kind of be up there on the stage, and I and I was desperate to be a child star, but no, nobody would exploit me. So that, that, was, that didn't work out. Uh, I had to wait a long time. You know, and then I went to Northwestern University. I was a theater major. Uh, but I just, I was, I was absolutely just fixed on this is what I was going to do. And nothing was going to stop me. And you were fixed on being a performer at yeah. the time. I always wrote. I, I was writing plays when I was a small child. I always was writing. But I, did, I somehow didn't really think of that as, as the career. It was just to be on stage. And ultimately, I began writing, really just to provide myself with opportunities to act. So that's where it started. You provided, you, you wrote yeah. stuff to give yourself yes. a shot. Well, I knew, you know, I, I've had, maybe because I'm from New York City or, or maybe just it, nature gave me a pragmatic uh, attitude uh, about life. So when I was at Northwestern and I was never cast in any play... You know, it made me think, uh, I might have a hard time in the professional theater. That, you know, maybe I'm a rather eccentric type, shall we say. You know, it may not work out. You know, and, and it was rather devastating uh, revelation to, to think, you know, this thing that I want to do so badly, maybe there's not a real place for me. So what do I do? But fortunately, once again, being from New York City, when I would come home for vacation, I started seeing more experimental theater. And this was, let's say, in the early mid '70s, and it was kind of a golden age of experimental theater with these extraordinary figures like Charles Ludlam and Richard Foreman, and then the performance group, and you know, uh, and and particularly Charles Ludlam. When I saw him with his company, the Ridiculous Theatrical Company, and and it was almost as if I was hit by a tidal wave of of just seeing the possibilities of what life could have in store for me. Uh, creating my own work and 
maybe having my own company or um, just um, that theater could be whatever I chose it to be. It didn't have to be the um, Broadway fair that I had been raised on where maybe there was no place for me. You know, of course, you're considered this great artist, but at the same time, I see in what you did at Northwestern is this really entrepreneurial attitude. You, yeah, I always was... had that. Yeah, oh. I, I always had that. Of, um, that somehow I would do it myself. I get get the play on, do do it. Yeah, no, it's funny about that. I because in some ways, you know, I'm I'm kind of a a bit of a kook, and that you know the um, the mechanics of living sort of are a little bit beyond me. You know. I, I have trouble screwing in a light bulb. And I really, you know, it's it's a it's a problem being me. <laughs> Life is very difficult for those of us who have not mastered the mechanics of living, and everything is a challenge. You know, just really, you know, plugging in a lamp. You know, it's it's just, nothing works for me. I will uh, testify to that only because when Charles and I were arranging <laughs> this podcast, I said, well, I will text you my information. Charles, what's your phone number? And he said to me, how would I find that out? Yeah, no, so. it's, life is very difficult for me. You know, uh, I no sense of direction. I, I walk a mile out of my way every day. On the other hand, on the other hand, I, I you know, as a, particularly as a young person starting out, I... I booked myself around the country doing my act originally when I was because I was a solo performer for the first seven years of my career and and with no management at all and just booked myself around the country at small nonprofit theaters. I mean, I I was very driven and I made it work. Just had to do it. And what was that first act like? What was what did you do? Well, I uh, it, it was. How do I describe it? I, you know, I was a solo performer. I would be wearing just, you know, kind of neutral, you know, shirt and pants. And, and, and they were almost like um, screenplays where I would play all the characters and tell these very complicated narratives. Uh, and and I'd play men, women, anything that the na- narrative required. Uh, and I was very influenced by a number of people. First, there was a, a legendary, um, mon- I guess what you call her, mon- monologist or... Uh, um, Ruth Draper, who was a legendary figure in theater, I, she died. You know, when I, almost when I was born. You know, so I never saw her. But, but I, uh, her, she was uh, recorded late in her career, and her her rec- recordings of her monologues are just fascinating. I learned so much, and she was a big influence on Lily Tomlin and a lot of people. So her records, and then then other contemporary performers that I saw that I saw who could play multiple characters in a way that create an illusion that you were seeing an ensemble play. And I would do sometimes the dialogue back and forth between several characters, and it really the idea was to create that kind of illusion that you're seeing a, a whole play. So I did that, you know, and I kept learning, and I did that for uh, seven or eight years. And, and I learned so much about as a writer, about exposition, um, characterization, and, and as, certainly as a performer, performing for all so every kind of audience. It really was almost like when you hear about people who did vaudeville, you know, just and and I was frustrated because you know I wanted to be an overnight success naturally, but in a way things worked out just fine because I would not have been ready had my moment come sooner. I was not ready, but I gradually. Just you know, I I was, I was convinced. It's a slightly you know you're slightly deranged, you know, and you have that kind of faith in yourself. But uh, I was convinced that if I just kept at it with like a horse with blinders on, and if I kept learning and getting better, that it had to work. That there was just it had to, eventually I earn a living doing this, and it's going to work out for me. It's kind kind of nutty to it just didn't occur to me that it wouldn't. I mean, frustrating and you know, angry. Uh, you know, you know, why, you know, why, you know, uh, when's it going to be my turn? And the gatekeepers in my way, and and all that. And but never to the point that oh, you know, maybe I won't do this. Maybe it's not going to work. I remember, my, you know, I was raised by my aunt, and and she was very, very supportive. But I do remember one point her saying to me, "Well, you, you know, you need something to fall back on." I was like, "What?" 
She said, well, well, you draw very well. You could be an artist. I said, artist? That's a, you want to be a painter to fall back on? You know? And she said, well, Tony Bennett, said, that, he, he's a big star. She says, well, Johnny Carson has his sells you know his his clothes line I said, it's, it's hard enough trying to be an actor i should also have a line of menswear you know, you know nobody understands you know <laughs> and was there a moment was there a moment when you after this deranged period where you're like oh wait it it's working now i well thing when was, was that moment? well the thing was it was it was very difficult period for me my 20s were not fun because it got to the point as I years were going by that I was doing this, that I was getting better, and I would and I'd get rave reviews in reputable publications like the Washington Post, San Francisco Chronicle, the different cities I was in, and I would sell out. I'd be I'd play these different nonprofit theaters or small nonprofit theaters, um, various places, and I'd be there for a month at a time, you know. And I would, Jeez. you know, it wasn't just like a one night gig, you know. I'd be there for like a month and. And I'd sell out the theater, and I was a hit, you know, and, and give rave reviews. But I still couldn't earn a living in theater because I didn't, I didn't have any management, so I didn't work enough, you know. So I would, you know, I'd be, I'd close in San Francisco, great star, and then come home and have to be, do an office temp work, or I draw very well, so I, you know, I would be a quick sketch portrait artist, did a lot of crazy different things, and then, but then, I'd have my next gig in another city and do well. So that went on for for. Um, you know, about seven years, but getting better and better, but frustrating that, you know, just because the whole thing is to earn a living. That's, you know, you're not really a professional somehow unless you're earning a living. So that, that was the big, that was the dream, you know, not to win an Oscar or anything, but just to earn a living in your chosen profession is one of the most difficult accomplishments, I think, <laughs> known to mankind. And when did that happen for you? When did that moment that come? Be, it was very dramatic. Well, you know, I've been just doing this act, and I really was at kind of low ebb. And actually, it's kind of a mystical story because I was working as a quick sketch portrait artist for a, 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 an agency called Rent a Witch that booked tarot card readers in Palmas. And and I remember I was in this car with the head witch Barbara, and I was telling her that I that really my career that I was an, a performer, not a portrait artist, and uh, and I was so frustrated because. Wasn't you know I was getting a big break, and she said, "All right, this is what you're gonna do. She says, I'm giving you a recipe of an herbal bath, and you take these herbs and you and you put them in the bathtub, and you sit in that tub for a half hour, for six days. You went for half hour each day for six days, and you will find that your luck is gonna change. So I said, I'll do it. So I did it, and I sat, sat in that awful bathtub, oregano and garlic and like a bay leaf stuck up my ass and uh you know and i thought after a week i thought well, this is just ridiculous and i forgot about it and then you know a couple years later i started doing this timetable and my luck changed within that year i wish i still had that recipe i was gonna say we could we could market that together the I, charles bush recipe for recipe, success the bath i lost it i would because i thought it was i thought it was ridiculous but maybe it wasn't so anyway so because so the big twist was that um uh, this is 1984, and I knew this friend, this very exotic lady um, who was a performance artist, and she invited me to see her her act way down on the Lower East Side in Al Alphabet City, you know, which is a part of New York, with, where it's just Avenue A, Avenue B, Avenue C, and, and in 1984, it was a very scary neighborhood. It was you know, really, a lot of crack being done, and, and the buildings were mostly burned out and rubble, but occasionally there, there were little pockets of a, an interesting dance club or art gallery. And Madonna and Keith Haring came out of that um, environment. So I, you know, I was kind of scared. But I went down to this creepy place and it was a storefront art gallery performance space bar called the Limbo Lounge. And, and it was, oh, I was just dazzled. It was this kind of punk, gay, goth the audience and you know and, and, and the, you know, they didn't just hang pictures it was an art installation it was all very grotesque and like out of Cocteau or I don't know Berlin in the 20s I mean it really was very decadent and my friend's act was 
you know, you kind of had to be there. I mean, it was very strange indeed. But I was so enraptured that I immediately found this young man who owned the place. And I said, I would just love to do a show here. And he um, looked on the calendar and he didn't know who I was. And nobody knew who I was anyway. So he just gave me, you know, a weekend uh, a couple a month later. So I just quickly wrote, the, I was doing some office temp work and between phone calls, I just wrote this little sketch. I thought, well, I'll be in drag. I'll just be very decadent. I didn't want to do my regular severe, you know, performance art. You know, I'll, I'll be in drag. I'll just be really outrageous and I'll be the kind of v- vampire actress, you know, and I just, it was about a half hour long, this little skit, really. And um, I just asked some friends of mine who were basically told they were unemployable in the theater. So and we rehearsed a couple of times and literally spent no money because there was no stage. So you couldn't have a set. And you know, we kind of threw the costumes together with stuff in the closet. And um, we just had a ball for that weekend. We decided to do second weekend, third weekend, another little play there. And then the, this young man, Michael, who ran the place, said, we should be like a regular theater group there. So we just kept doing these plays every three weeks. And, and then particularly this one play, this Vampire Lesbians of Sodom, um, I don't know, just people kept coming, packing the joint. We get squeezing 250 people in this tiny space. And, um, and it, we were in the right place at the right time because it was like that six-month period just started to happen that all the media was talking about this crazy performance art scene in the East Village. So People Magazine and New York Magazine would do big stories about it. And our plays had these crazy titles like Vampire, Lesbians, and Sodom and Theodora, she bitch of Byzantium, you know, and so it was a good for a punchline in the article. So we got this great publicity and, you know, we didn't spend a penny on publicity, but so they were lined up down the block and finally uh, Ken Elliott, who was my roommate and directing the show and producing it as such and acting it, said, you know, maybe, you know, maybe this is our, our big break, this crazy thing that we're doing strictly for our own amusement. And we tried to get some producers to move it to a real place and nobody would touch it. And then we, Ken, figured out that if we raised $55,000, we could at least open it at an off-Broadway theater. So we got the Provincetown Playhouse on McDougal Street and we got the money together. You know, for, you know, it took us about six months. We got the, it was a lot of money for us. Yeah, what year was that? 84. I mean, it was ridiculously low even for 84, but... But still, still, that's a lot of for, money. For people who had no money at all. I mean, you know, but everybody's mother and, you know, grandmother gave $5,000. You know, we had to raise 55000 We had about 250 investors. And they were, it was like dead of $5 a, a unit. And, um, so we opened, you know, and we really had just enough to open. That was kind of it. Then, you know, sure enough, the opening night came and we got a rave review in the New York Times. Just rave review and everybody. And it was very touching because... Uh, everyone got mentioned in the review I and mean, all these people who've been so discouraged. You know, it was, it was just a, the greatest moment, maybe the greatest moment of my life. And nothing, even, you know, I had a big Broadway opening and, you know, that, but I don't think anything can be as exciting as when the moment when you know your life really is going to change. Because my life didn't change that much from, you know, uh, I had a, had a nice career already before Alger's wife, but to go from office temp to professional was the big leap and you know that show ran five years and uh i was in it for about two then we replaced everybody and got new actors and we went on to other shows and um so, so anyway but that was a long answer to a simple question he asked me but it's you know those of us who had, who were involved we consider it kind of brigadoon mixed with um 42nd street and the greatest story ever told and you obviously have been known for a lot of your drag performances, but yeah. was that the first time? Was that the first one? Yeah, where could, did that start? I could say it was, but maybe I could say it wasn't. Um, well, thing was that when I had seen Ludlum, you know, in, oh, when I was really in my late teens or when I first saw it, you know, saw him and, and he used dra- drag and as a theatrical element and, uh, and I, now, you know, I have an andro- androgynous nature and I was always kind of doing kind of imp- celebrity impressions and, and even more than that for, you know, like for my friends, but even more, you know, I was always kind of improvising my own kind of movie dialogue without thinking that maybe that's kind of what I should really be doing. 
so when I was living in Chicago, after I graduated from Northwestern, I stayed in Chicago uh, two more years because I wasn't, it, it's hard when you're from New York City to sort of start your career in a way because everybody else kind of comes to New York to start a career, but, you know, when you're there already, it's kind of, you kind of need somewhere to come from. It, that sounds kind of nutty, but if you can, uh, so I, I stayed in Chicago and while I was there, I met a group of, of people who uh, I was in a play and I met some people and uh, I said that, you know, I had this fantasy of starting a company kind of like Ludlam and, and writing plays and being the lead and, and they all kind of wanted to hook on. And so I started doing these kind of drag plays in Chicago and doing them in bars and movie theaters up to the late show and stuff. And, and um, but they were, it was the wrong group. You know, there, there were people who ultimately didn't really share the same, you know, hopes and dreams with me and kind of resented me actually and because I was getting all the attention. and It was a rather awful experience. And so funny how it was something that was so, and I was so burnt from it that that's why I became a solo performer in a way because, you know, I didn't want to have to depend on anyone anymore. And then yet, ironically, 10 years later, this greatest thing happened to me with the same type of group, only this was a group of people who, who believed in me and felt I had something to offer and, and were grateful for the roles that I wrote for them. And, you know, so it was totally like mirror images of, of each other, one disastrous and one fantastic. Do you enjoy writing more <clears throat> now or performing more? You started as a performer and then the writing came. What, do you have a preference? It, it sort of depends, you know, on my mood, really. Some days I think, you know, when I'm so in the throes of, writing something and I am I I am happiest I'm happiest when I'm really right in the middle of rewriting something and just going into into that document on the computer five times a day just with a new idea and just looking reading it again and changing and changing a line changing a word changing it back changing it again I guess I am happiest then but but I've, I've derived enormous, enormous joy from just being in a play. And, and, and there's something, as an actor-writer, you know, there aren't too many of us. Um, Actually, there are a lot of you, just not very, not a right? successful uh, well, group, which is really a testament to you. There's something just wonderful about creating this wor fictional world where for two hours... The world is exactly as I planned, and everybody's saying exactly the lines that I want them to say, and moving at the same in the same place, and I'm in the center of it all. It's uh, it's fantastic. It's yeah, you know, you know and, and uh, I don't know, I you know, I don't know where my future lies, where what I want to do at this point. I have many notions and ideas, maybe plays, maybe not. I don't know, but I. When you ask me that question, you know, I've just, yes, I have just derived enormous satisfaction and, and joy at writing, and particularly writing and acting in my own plays. How do you edit yourself when you're writing and speaking your own words? Is it difficult for you? Do you get in fights with yourself? <laughs> you no, no. Fortunately, I've always worked with a director. You know, I, you know, others in my position, like Charles Ludlam, were also directors, and I've never done that i don't know i never wanted to, i never desired to direct a play I've, I've directed some films i directed a feature film and a short subject and i love that but i think it's harder to direct a play than it is a movie um and i don't know if i really have a talent for it i'm a good acting coach but i don't know if i'd be good at staging necessarily or even want to so i always worked with the director and i've worked with directors from the very be the very beginning of a beginning of a project uh work with them really as dramaturg so i've always kind of resented the the role of dramaturg when we've gone to non-profit theaters because i've been working so closely for two years with this director that you know don't want anybody else muscling in and yet i know that you know numerous very successful writers have had extraordinary experiences with dramaturgs who've developed them and i i've never had that but i've had these profound relationships with 
with my directors, and I've worked with very few people. You know, I've in a, in a career that's almost forty years old. I've probably worked with maybe I can't count them on one hand the directors I've actually worked with, maybe hand hand and a half. You know, I do many plays with the same person, Carl Andrus. Now, the past fifteen years, almost without exception. You know, I. And they work as dramaturgs, so I don't really need the... They're, they're the outside eye, and, and they don't seem to be afraid to tell me when I'm wrong. Nobody seems to be terribly uh, intimidated by me at all, but I, you know, um, I listen. I sometimes, I find when I get the, get notes, I, 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 I sort of fall silent, but it's not out of disapproval. I just kind of absorb it. I just kind of... Sit, I listen, I listen, and then I go home and I, I might stew for a while, like, oh, that's ridiculous notion. No. Think some more about it. Well, I'll just take a look at, I'll open up the file again. What the, it's ridiculous. And, well, you know, I suppose I could do that. Well, that's a funny line. That's not exactly what he asked for, but that's good. Yeah, well, this is good. You know, that was a smart idea he had. You know, that's kind of the process. So, you know, it's, um, I don't think I've ever, I, I think I've had things where I felt it was more destructive with the, the actual outside dramaturg who has gotten me confused and had talked a good game and then got me confused till I didn't really know what the play was about. And, and then, Turned out the play wasn't very good. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the director as dramaturg rather than yet another voice. Yeah. Now, some directors are. I, there may be some directors who that's not their skill. You know, that their it's their great imagination is in stage pictures and that sort of thing. But I, I've had one great experiences with the director as dramaturg. Tell me a little bit about uh, Allergist's Wife and how that began and started for you. Well, in a way, you know, you know we're, I'm meeting you today because we were at this reading of my play, The Green Heart, this musical that I did in, in the mid-90s, and Alger's Wife is in a sense directly uh, connected to that, because uh, um, we did The Green Heart at Manhattan Theater Club, and while we were doing that, I, I became acquainted with Lynn Meadow, the artistic director there, and we just kind of hit it off immediately. And she wasn't involved in the production. She, you know, she, you know, she was the artistic director of the theater. But you know, we just, you know, hit it off big. And then the opening night of Green Heart and the reviews were were disappointing. And Lynn said to me, um, "So I'd like MTC to be your your artistic home, and I'll produce your next play, whatever it is." I was like, "Wow, you know, I could, <laughs> I was like, wow, that's some." you know, leap of faith. And I thought, well, I better, you know, take her up on this. I thought, well, and Manhattan Theater Club isn't really the place for vampire lesbians part two. <laughs> you know, so uh, I thought, what would be, uh, you know, something to do there? And I had this character that I had done in a solo show called Miriam. I had a solo show called Flipping My Wig at the WPA Theater. And, uh, and it was a different kind of collection of pieces that I did. And one of them was about this sort of Upper West Side Jewish frustrated raging lady uh, Miriam Passman and it was a re- and it was kind of the first time that I had really delved into my own kind of background in New York and it was very sp- it was six minutes long but it was this very specific thing and, and it was really good and for a long time I'd thought gee I'd like to write a play around that kind of lady and be and something really well observed from what I knew uh, and then when Lynn made that offer to me, I thought, oh, well, this is a good opportunity to, because uh, it's kind of about the MTC subscribers. They are Miriam Passman, all these sort of people with these kind of culturally obsessed, you know, uh, women. And I, I uh, played kind of self kind of came to me, and uh, I wrote it fairly quickly. You know, I really, I knew those people. I knew that milieu. And then I saw Linda Lavin in a play called um, Death Defying Axe. And I, you know, I obviously knew Linda Lavin, but of her, but 
in that play, she really she was kind of playing a character kind of like that. And so I, as I wrote the play, I had her in mind as I continued working on it. I finished the play and gave it to Lynn Meadow, and she loved it. And she said, let's do a reading right away. And who's your fantasy? Marjorie was the character in the play. I said, Linda Lavin. So let's get her. And we got her to do the reading. And it was an um, extraordinary thing. She, cause I, knowing Linda now, I'm sure she was reading it cold. I'm sure she didn't prepare for that reading. But it was a perfect, perfect match of actress and role. And I, I've never seen the, the like of it again. This reading, because there was, the actors are just kind of sitting at a table and then, you know, there's an audience of you know, the interns and various drones and et cetera. And, uh, and Linda just, it was everything that she ended up doing in the show for real was at this reading. And at one point, you know, there's a big dramatic scene with fight with the mother, the elderly mother. And then Linda just got up from the table. And went, oh, where's she going? And she went to the window was standing there, you know, and just, she was in the, just acting it. It was so thrilling. We, after it was over, you know, we, Lynn and I were, you know, like hungry, like dogs, our tongues hanging out. Just, you know, so you'll, you'll do the play, ha ha. Mm, I don't know. I'm not sure. And, and for nine months, she kept us dangling. And I, I was determined that she was going to do that play. And I stalked her. I just, oh, I was relentless. I, would, I, I went to LA where she was doing collected stories, showed up there. I wrote her letters comparing her to Bart, Bernhard and Duza. I, I was just shameless and she buckled and decided to do it. Well, worked uh, before this deranged period of your life, this yeah, intense gonna, passion. You really, if you really want something, you just have to go for it. And there's, I've had long periods where I've sometimes felt I lost that, um, uh, intensity. But, you know, when I, when I really want something, I, I go for it. Wikipedia's entry about that play <laughs> it say? says, in his first play written for a mainstream audience. Oh, <laughs> well, that word, that word. I oh, know. I had a word. I hate that word. I had a feeling you would. Well, don't you, now, this is my, now, tell me if you agree with this. I think the only difference between mainstream and downtown or whatever you want to call it is the size of your publicity budget you could do the same you could you know go on a broadway stage and you know take off all your clothes and you know humiliate yourself you know and if you have ads on taxi cabs and on you know everywhere you're mainstream yeah if you do it you do it, you know, in a garage somewhere you're downtown. It's what we were talking about before when you were saying the frustrating years of your life because of the gatekeepers, et cetera. Once yeah. someone opens a Broadway theater to you and lets you do your whatever show yeah. you're doing, you're main, mainstream. You're mainstream. You've got that budget. You're getting yeah. people in there. It doesn't matter what the content is. Yeah. How long you run, that's, of course, Well, maybe something thing. different. But, yeah, I, I really do think this. Is, so, yes, it, it. so I've told the story before, but I'll tell it on your podcast. Um <clears throat> So, well, first of all, you know, when you do something noteworthy, you know, the press and, you know, you have your narrative that season there about you and you have to kind of go with it and, and have, and you have to have some kind of, under, you know, understanding of the way showbiz works or, or that your story has to be compressed in 30 words or less, you know, so that season, it was the the story was that this downtown drag queen had so shockingly wrote this mainstream Neil Simon kind of comedy. That's that's that was my story that season. However, only oh five years before I had written a play called "You Should Be So Lucky," which was a Jewish comedy. And that was had a rave review in the Times and and uh, by Brantley and and you know had a nice run off Broadway, but we forgot that part because it didn't go with the the narrative, you know. So and I'm with you, you know. I want to sell tickets. I'm, I'm I'll buy it, but it did sort of bug me when, 
when uh, the, the mainstream phrase was bandied about so much because I kind of felt there was a little bit of a, of a put down of everything I'd done for the last 25 years. You know, it just, that isn't a wonderful, finally he's mainstream, you know, and I was very proud of the work I'd done for 20 years or more with wonderful collaborations that I was very proud of and, and things that, and, and in truth, since I'd performed at the Limbo Lounge, you know, in Avenue C, every play of mine had started at, you know, reputable nonprofit, you know, the WPA Theater or whatever, and, and had tran each each play had transferred commercially off Broadway, which certainly doesn't happen anymore. So I, you know, I, you know, my joke was that my audience wasn't all pinheads and carny folk. You know, I just was, you know, I was, I think I was kind of mainstream, but just not on Broadway. But the, the, but the night that everything changed was uh, one night I was home watching Survivor, I think. And, and Charles a, Bush, a Survivor fan. Oh, you I've, I've never year. missed a single episode of Survivor in 20 seasons. 20? I've never missed a single episode. And you can't operate a DVR, right? So you watch them okay. live. Now that I can do, that I can do, that I can do. With trouble, now that I can do. Um, my sister can't, because she's worse than I am. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I was watching Survivor, and I, was, and I looked at the clock, and it was like 8.35, and I was like, oh... Linda must be going toward the end of Act Act One, and I just made a lot of money. <laughs> and something like, oh, I love being mainstream. <laughs> That's a great story. Someone actually told me once, Ken, you'll know you've made it when you get a check without having to show up for half hour. <laughs> yes. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I tell you, everybody in the world. I wish everybody in the world could have a hit Broadway play. It is the most wonderful thing in the world. And I've been desperate to try to get another one. It hasn't happened. Not for lack of trying either. Uh, because it's hard. Well, what's next for you? What are you working on now? What are you... Well, you know, I've been, honestly, um, for the past year, I've been having a, a wonderful time just exploring all, like every other kind of uh, avenue of creativity other than writing a play. Uh, I've been having a wonderful time I've been painting and selling my artwork, which is awfully nice. And 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 then you fell back on being an artist. I felt that my aunt, like would, my aunt, if she had lived, would have been so happy that I'm actually selling my artwork now, and uh, like Tony Bennett. And and then I've been doing my cabaret act, and and for the past three years, and traveling all over. I this past year I was in Paris and London and San Francisco, Palm Springs, Boston. In Miami, uh, Atlanta, New Orleans. Uh, I'm having a wild old time. And my pianist, uh, Tom Judson, is, you know, my dear, dear friend. And, and we just have fun traveling around, you know, getting new material together, learning songs. And, you know, I'm not the world's greatest singer, but I approach the songs I choose as a storyteller and as acting pieces. And it seems to work very well, and so I, I'm I'm loving it. And and I never toured as an actor. I always wanted to tour our shows, but economically it really was. It seemed like they were best in smaller theaters, and it just was too expensive to do. So this has been a, a way of. I mean, I don't want to call, come up to Norma Desmond here, but I I'm going to all these places, and I and when I do my act. As soon as it's over, I, I just sort of stay there and take pictures of everybody, kind of like Santa Macy's. And, but I meet everybody in the audience. And I've just, and it's been very gratifying and, and even rather emotional for me to, to meet people all, all over the country who, um, appreciate me and who I've meant something to through, uh, either the, you know, the couple little cult movies I've made or, or seeing my plays done in local productions, or reading them, or you know, so or, or I wrote this one novel that um, seems to have gotten around somehow, and, um, and so it's been that's a wonderful thing after you know almost four decades to to find out that there are people you know all over who you meant something to. 
you started out touring in a way. Something I'm tells back me exactly where I came. But started you have management from. now, I assume. <laughs> kind of, kind of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my manager. I, you know, my. I have this wonderful manager, Jeff Melnick, who I've been with for uh, about thirty years, and he's really a he's really a, a screen, screenwriter, screen and TV writer manager, you know. But he and I did a lot of that stuff with him at a certain point. Um, but he just loves the theater, and so he he doesn't make much money from me, but he just loves. I'm his conduit to to the theater, and lately I've turned him into a cabaret booking agent at the age of 70 years old. He's suddenly Broadway Danny Rose. And he's kind of, you know, he's a man of, of great enthusiasm. So he's suddenly, you know, because he's, he's, he's kind of half retired, actually. He really has two more, two clients. One who makes him a lot of money in TV and then me. And um, so he, I think he's getting a real kick out of suddenly at 70, you know, calling up the cabarets and trying to up my fee, uh, you know. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, you're, my last question for you, which I ask all my guests, it's um, become known as the genie question, which yeah. is I want you to imagine that uh, the genie from Aladdin comes into the fabulous Sag Harbor Inn here where we are yeah. and says to you, Charles, I've admired your career so much. You've worn so many hats. You've been so determined. I'm going to grant you one wish. You can change whatever you want about Broadway. Or the theater. Anything, whatever bugs you more than anything, keeps you up at night, drives you crazy. I'll change one thing for you with the snap of a finger. What would that one thing that you would change be? Well, if we're talking fantasy land. Fantasy. Fantasy land, I wish that, you know, it was economically feasible to, that all tickets to Broadway shows were no more expensive than $25 and that everybody could make a big fortune from it but the public could see it for $25 I would change everything everything and it certainly would Charles I want to thank you so much for it's midnight now where we are so <laughs> thank you for doing this after a very long day uh, I so and I know all my listeners so admire your passion your determination to get you where you are I know a lot of my listeners also wear a lot of hats and you are uh, the perfect example of a, of a person that and an artist that can perform right and do just about everything because of your determination to do so so thank you for that and thank all of you for listening and we will see you next time I'm gonna be a producer look out bro.